Welcome to today's Military and Aerospace Electronics Webinar, Advanced Cooling Approaches for Rugged Systems Designs, sponsored by Elma Electronic in Fremont, California. I'm John Keller, Chief Editor of Military and Aerospace Electronics. As new chip technologies are designed into cards that align with the Sensor Open Systems Architecture, or SOSA, technical standard, and with OpenVPX, physical cooling limits become more challenging and influence systems design. Across all circuit card types, multi-core single board computers, ethernet switches, GPGPUs, high-performance FPGA cards, Power dissipation easily can exceed 100 watts or greater, and conventional cooling schemes are hitting the performance wall. Open standards, such as SOSA, point to alternative cooling standards. One approach is called AFT, short for Airflow Through Cooling. AFT is already being successfully fielded in standard and non-standard applications. VITA also defines AFT cooling standards, and they come in different flavors. Today, there are three AFT approaches defined as VITA 48.5, VITA 48.8, and VITA 48.9. The approach currently adopted by SOSA is VITA 48.8. This webinar will examine the thermal challenges posed by these high performance cards and more importantly, show how they can be solved with cooling approaches like AFT. Our speakers today are Ken Grobe, Director of Embedded Technologies at Elma Electronic in Fremont, California, and David Gash, Manager of COTS Engineering at Bellman Electronics in Hopog, New York. If you have any technical difficulties during today's session, Simply type your issue into the Ask a Question box and a member of our team will assist you. You also can click on the question mark help button in the upper right corner of the screen. Additionally, we welcome your questions during today's event. We will answer as many of, of your questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but please feel free to send in your questions at any time. To do so, simply type your question into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. Also, please be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Military and Aerospace Electronics website within the next week. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. So, let's get started today with Ken Grobe, Director of Embedded Technologies at Elma Electronics. Ken? Thanks, John. So good afternoon. Today I'd like to talk about open BBX cooling and power trends. By way of introduction, I'll cover technology trends associated with card power, capabilities of current cooling standards, a little bit about the AFT approach, some characteristics of 48.8, benefits to the, to the system designer, and then a look at how the ecosystem is um, coming along relative to available product. So if we look at power and cooling trends today, um, we are kind of limited at a board power, a total dissipated power of about 50 to 60 watts. If you look at this chart to the right, where we have temperature against power, uh, as we uh, look at the first curve, we're looking at junction temperature, starting at 85C, and as power goes up, the junction temperature goes up. And really what our goal in cooling a, a card is to maintain a specific junction temperature that's specified by the chip manufacturer. It's sort of the upper limit of that within the margin limits to keep the car operating at a, a reasonable temperature and support a good MTBF. We work up from the bottom to the top. We see using conduction cooling um, with traditional techniques, 
that we're starting at maybe an input of 40 C, this is the input air into the box, that's used to generate the uh, uh, cooling wall to sink heat, to get rid of it, and to cool the cards. If you look at a more exotic approach to 48.2, where you could use heat pipes, or we use more exotic materials that are more expensive, uh, we could extend the limit for the inlet temperatures of the box to 55 C and it practically it can be extended all the way up to 70. However, this has to do with uh, what cooling fans that you'll use to support moving air through the box to cool the cold wall. And then ultimately we see 48.8 um, starting out with a higher inlet temperature limit above 71 degrees um, and giving a flatter curve as you move out into power. So it gives us an advantage. So what we see is applications driving up the performance and the need for higher ambient temperatures, where we're actually seeing our uh, customers asking us to increase the ambient temperature and not decrease it, which makes it even more difficult to stay within the standard cooling techniques today that are used. So what are the existing cooling schemes? The predominant cooling scheme is something called Vita 48.2 or conduction cooled uh, cards. And to the right, you see them. Basically, it's a card with a heat sink and a wedge lock off to the edge. And what's happening here is this technique relies on a thermal path from the chip surface to a heat sink that conducts it up to the edge of the card and to the wedge lock. And if you look at this green block, this is actually the wedge lock being clamped in a channel uh, where there is a resistance between the edges of the wedge lock, wedge lock and the channel and a series of resistances that happen from the heat sink and the core of the card as the heat is moved conductively to the wedge lock and then through this channel to the cold wall. Once the heat's transferred to the cold wall, the box has to remove the heat, and typically it's done with a convection conduction technique where air is drawn through thin to cool the cold wall, which allows the temperature differentiation, differential to support heat transfer at the outside of the box. So what this becomes is a stack of, uh, of sort of impedances to the outside world, and it requires a sufficient temperature differential between the box and the card guide to get rid of the heat. So taking a look at the landscape, as John kicked off and mentioned some of this, 48.2 practically constrains our total dissipated power at the 50 to 60 watt range. And what we're seeing is cards themselves right now are starting to really push this power envelope up. If you look at single board computers, what we're capable of getting today is up to a 20 core single board computer. Then that can have a power that can exceed 100 watts. So what one must do if you're going to use this in a conduction cool environment, which it will be available this way, is you actually have to throttle the card and limit the power that you can actually dissipate, which really doesn't let you get the performance out of the card. We see the same thing happening with Ethernet switches going from 40 to 100 gig, where they used to be about 45 watts, and now they'll push the 60 watt envelope when they're being fully exercised. GPGPUs, it could be well in excess of 120 watts, but for the embedded space would be in the 45 to 120 watt range. New devices like the Ampere 45 to A4500 are driving the limit up here. So significantly more capability, but with that we get a significant increase in power. And lastly, SDRs, software-defined radios, for example, built on FPGAs with ADD converters, and these could easily push the limit above 60 watts as well. So if we look at a new cooling approach, and as John mentioned, MOSA has adopted uh, AFT or 48.8 as part of sensor sensor open system architecture, or I should say SOS has adopted it. Um, this gives us a different technique. So looking at the, the benefits of that technique, with a series of resistance, resistances, thermal resistances that we get in a conduction cooled uh, chain, if you look at this diagram, where the heat bottleneck to get out through this guide interface here at the channel, AFT improves our thermal um, dissipation or our ability to remove heat by two to one. So this is a huge change. And it's done by simplifying the stack of resistances we have by conducting or, or contacting the chip with the heat frame and using convection 
conduction and convection techniques to remove the heat from the heat frame by driving air through a channel in the frame that's made up of uh, binned uh, con convective surfaces. So this gives us uh, a much better leverage in the same uh, basic card geometry um, as a, a conduction cooled card. So how does AFT help with the cooling challenges? By simplifying the thermal paths and driving air through the heat sink, we can accommodate better total dissipated power. So in actuality, in some ways, this is a simpler approach from a thermal transfer point of view. It gives us a gain. The other thing that this can do is help with overall system weight. So you can actually make the heat sinks and then um, the chassis itself, uh, depending on how the chassis needs to be built for the uh, conduction, uh, weight can be reduced in the chassis because you're really doing all the exchange here right at the card surface, so or at the card edge. So one doesn't have to um, worry about the flow through the entire box. So it allows you to use alternate materials in the chassis and it can potentially allow you to reduce weight. Ultimately, by keeping the cards cooler, we're going to increase the MTBF for the meantime between failures. So it has another benefit in, from that point of view. So if we look at what's in the toolbox, what methods do we have that are standard that the ecosystem, the industry can leverage? If you look at the VITA standards, we've got 48.1, which is an air-cooled card. This is good where the environment's not harsh, but when it's harsh, then you'd be exposing the card directly to things that you may not want, like salt. So this is often not used in a rugged environment. 48.2, it's used in our mainstay cooling method today, used by almost every manufacturer, and it's widely adopted, and it's uh, highly rugged. 48.5 air flow through is used only in 6U, and it requires uh, a license for the seal method. 48.7 is called air flow by. It's used in 3U and 6U. It's been widely used, and it's capable, uh, but maybe not as um, conducive to swap C. And then lastly, 48.8, which is called air flow through, is available in 3U and 6U. And the industry looks at that as being uh, optimized maybe for uh, swap C and uh, thermal dissipation. So look, just a quick glance at 48.5. 48.5, again, 6U cards, air is driven through a channel that's in the middle of the card, which is the heat exchanger. And its pros is it's sealed from the cooling air. This is good, so the chips themselves aren't exposed to harsh elements. Um, the flip side, it's only for 6U, and it uses a proprietary seal design. Next, air flow by uses this clamshell technique where the air is pushed around the clamshell. And the clamshell is sealed, and then it's sealed to the chassis. And it uses um, a different set of install, install and extract uh, hardware that replace the wedge lock. So benefit of this is it's sealed. It supports 3U and 6U. Um, the seal is somewhat complex if you consider the cons, and it's not very optimized for swap C. So that brings us to 48.8. 48.8 is similar to 48.5. It avoids the patented seal arrangement. Air is ducted through the module's heat exchanger. The circuits are not exposed to the cooling air. Uh, that's driven through the card. So this makes, uh, makes it better from an environmental point of view. It uses a one and a half degree taper that's used to make a wedge that allows compression to a material to form a gasket in the card guide. And you'll see this in the next slide. And it has a simple mounted extraction scheme with a jack screw. And this jack screw has actually been improved to make it more robust in, in the standard. So some of the cons with the jack screw, and that's been kind of um, resolved. And the gaskets in 48.8 are not specifically defined. So it's up to the end user to define that gasket material. And lastly, it's not prescriptive relative to pressure drop and flow rate. That's left up to the thermal engineer to figure out uh, what mass flow you need through the heat sink to do the cooling. So if we look at how that's done. You have a tapered card guide here with a channel in the chassis. 
And then if you look at the top view of the card, you've got a heat sink or uh, a heat frame that has a foil channel that gives a large convective surface area for the air to work with. And then if you look at it from the right side view, plugged and made it into the VPX connectors, you have a card that's slightly wedge shaped that uses a standard 3U160 card. So you can mo easily modify base designs to go to 48.8. And then this allows uh, a seal to take place on the edge with the uh, air channel that's used in the heat dissipator. So again, what do we obtain? What's the performance benefit of 48.8? And 48.2, we're looking at a limit in the 50 to 60 watt range for a 3U uh, module. And with 48.8, we're looking at a uh, TDP of 50 to 100 watts. And this has actually been done well above 100 watts in the 120 to 130 watt range uh, using AFT methods. With 48.2, you can improve that if you can provide a liquid cooled cold wall, but this is not always allowed or you don't have the medium to um, use as the liquid uh, in the design. So quite often you're pigeonholed and can't do that. And then you have, of course, um, higher limits for 6U off on the right column. So basically we're looking at about a two to one benefit. So looking at um, a model for this at a 100 watt card and seeing what is possible, um, we use this as an example where you can see the different uh, TDPs of the devices. Now the benefit here again is that there's a plate with thermal interface material that contacts the devices, moves the heat up to the heat exchanger, and then the heat exchanger has air being driven through it. So if we look at what the model tells us, um, if we use pure conduction, we're looking at a junction temperature of devices of about 116 degrees C, which would be in the limit of the upper end. If we use convection with no thermal interface material at 1.2 inches, we're at 120. If we use thermal interface material convection at 1.2, we're at 98. And at 1.5, we're at 86. So what we're seeing is a 30 degree difference in the junction temperature by, by going to um, the 48.8 cooling method on a 1.5 inch pitch. So, Looking at the ecosystem, and this is some kind of neat thing that's been happening lately with 48.8. We all knew that we would get here to the place where it would behoove system designers to use this technique, and it's been being used for a number of years now. But what hadn't happened yet was the ecosystem developing off-the-shelf products, and now this is the case. We're seeing these. So here's a five-slot development chassis from Elma that um, provides rotary blowers on a per slot basis for you to be able to cool your payload cards. And this is set up so you can make measurements and you can adjust the air flows through the cards to check the performance. So really a development stand and it's based on a 1.5 inch backplane that uses uh, profiles that are so so lined. So these are slot profiles. So you have payload, IOSBC, a switch and a timing slot in this development box. So this has been developed to make it easy for people to get started in 48.8 development. So then what would you plug into that? Um, looking at 3U 48.8 AFT IO intensive SBCs, concurrent, te uh, concurrent technologies has come up with a um, eight core IO intensive single board computer with a hundred gig data plane. So this is current technology with a very nice heat sink uh, ready to go that's 48.8.8 out of the box. Um, in a similar vein, Contron has developed a compute intensive card, 20 core. And then when speaking about 20 core processors, here's a good example of one, 20 cores um, capable. So this board's going to be able to dissipate uh, quite a bit of heat and reason being for them to look at the 48.8 cooling option for this card. So another card that's available off the shelf. Following suit, there are also Ethernet switches coming, both 40 and 100 gig, and also hybrid switches that'll be out then in the next quarter. So there will be switches to go with. So we're seeing the ecosystem starting to fill out. 
That takes us to Bellman, who's been working on power solutions. And I'm not going to dive into this because David will bring this up next. But, of course, we need a way to power these things. And power supplies make sense relative to 48.8 capability. And Bellman has joined the ecosystem with a power offering. So let me wrap this up. Um, by way of summary, we're seeing our cards, SBC switches, and GPGUs go beyond 50 watts. Driving a need for higher TDPs and, a new cool, and new cooling schemes or alternate cooling schemes. We see SOSA uh, being forward thinking and adopting and allowing 48.8, um, so more complex systems may be addressed. And we look at the market actually picking this up, or the uh, I guess the prime contract space picking it up, and building systems that have used 48.8, and actually built systems that use 48.8 and conduction technology and hybrid implementations as well, um, to give the uh, marketplace the solutions that they need that are based on higher TDP uh, functional blocks um, in GPX. So key benefit to AFT, it supplies us with a better MTBF. We're seeing a nice development in the ecosystem of off-the-shelf cards, which supports the use of the standard because this at least gives us a market where not everyone has to invent everything and we can get things off the shelves. And then by looking at 48.8, there's also another standard called 48.9 that's looking to improve the gasket definition and a few other facets of the 48.8 approach as an alternative. Currently, 48.8 is the released and, uh, let's say, pointed to standard in SOSA. So 48.9 is also being worked on in SOSA, so it may give an alternative. So for that, I pass it over to uh, David Gash to talk to us about power supplies in 48.8. Oh, yes. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, so for those who don't know, my name is David Gash. Um, I'm the manager of cost engineering at Bell Electronics. At Bell Electronics, we're focusing on uh, Vita 62 power supplies. So as Ken had talked about these systems and their uh, increasing in power dissipation and uh, TDP, you're going to need something to, that powers this electronics and, uh, and provides that conversion from the host platform to the power that your cards and your system needs. And that's where uh, Vita 62 power supplies come in. Like most other uh, VPX cards, the, the predominant cooling methodology is currently conduction cooling, and, and Ken outlined a, uh, a good an introduction as to why we are reaching the limits of, of performance with this cooling technology, uh, mainly because the, the cooling medium, which in this case is either air or liquid, is not going directly over the electronics. There's separation, whether through the uh, rails and the wedge locks and the, uh, the card cage itself. This limits our performance of payload cards, often needing some level of derating, um, our power supply included. As an example, uh, th some, in some, this product, um, which is a SOSA tech uh, line product, it, is a, uh, it can do 700 watts of power at 85 degrees C on the rails, which is, would be the, the, the boundary condition. But if you were able to lower the temperature, you would be able to get up to 800 watts. And that's where these alternate cooling technologies allow us to unlock basically un, unused potential in the electronics um, to increase the system capability. So our, so we have Airflow through, which is something that uh, Ken introduced, and here you can see uh, our 1.5 inch card with the heat exchanger, which is the uh, the finned area, and that's a folded fin that gets brazed to an aluminum housing, which is acts as a heat exchanger. One of the one of the concerns with the initial version of of Vita 48.8 was its ruggedization level and how uh, how well it could uh, hold up to intense in, uh, environments, vibration, and shock because of the, the mounting mechanism. Vita 48.8 was actually revised in 2022 in order to modify the front panel. And you can see that this, the card depicted here has that revised panel, which provides a thicker mounting uh, 
uh, front panel as well as additional um, mounting holes for more fasteners in order to provide more secure holding of the card in, in order to meet the ruggedized environment. On this slide, you can see the insertion of the card into the, into the, uh, the, heat, the card cage, and you can see that in addition to those two jack screws, which are integral to the, system, to the card front panel, there are two more fasteners that also secure it and provide that level of ruggedization to meet the Vita 487.3 vibration requirements uh, that are what would be typically seen, uh, expected for a car deployed in a ruggedized system. Uh, one other cooling option that Bellman has developed, which is uh, something that we saw uh, a need for, is what we call air flow over. In this context, the thought is that you have a FIDA 48.1 system that you've de developed and you want to be able to deploy that in a ruggedized environment. And you want to minimize the, uh, the swap of your, of your system. So you might not be able to withstand the 1.5 inch pitch of the uh, VITA 48.8 and, and along with it the complexities of the card cage. Uh, in this case, we've uh, designed uh, cards that take our conduction cooled heat frame and add the fins to it, and that only consumes 0.2 inches. The benefit of this is it gives you the rugged mounting that the wedge locks provide with the benefits of the airflow cooling over the, elect over the electronics by allowing you to blow the air across the card cage. Uh, we've seen people interested in this for uh, ruggedized deployed uh, systems that uh, don't necessarily want the complexity that Vita 48.8 provides. As far as overhead, though, from an engineering perspective, uh, one of the things that this airflow cooling trend has, has created is a need for uh, CFD, or computational fluid dynamics analysis, of the, uh, of the card. Uh, and here on this slide, you can see an example of uh, analysis that we did to uh, check different use cases of our card for different air pressures, um, fat, uh, air volume metrics, and temperatures in order to verify that we are keeping all of our electronics below their rate of junction temperatures. What the outcome of these analysis provide is these curves that, we can, that, that are provided to the customer in order to uh, integrate their this card into their system, which allows interoperability. On the left-hand side, you can see the, the flow rate required versus the inlet temperature. Uh, this is basically how much air you need to push through the card in order to maintain, uh, in this case, uh, what we consider our 90 degrees C hop spot temperature, which maintains all the junction temperature below their required. And you can see that we characterize this between negative 40 degrees C inlet air and 71 degrees C inlet air. On top of that, we also provide a predicted pressure drop versus the airflow rate, which basically tells you how hard your fan has to blow in order to get that volume of air through it. Uh, and with these two uh, curves combined, a thermal designer can design a chassis and select a fan and all the ducting that is needed in a system in order to ensure interoperability um, of the card in that system with their analysis. And one of the benefits we see of this kind of approach is that the electronics, the, you know, the, the CCA assembly between all these three uh, coolant technologies can actually be made to be the same. So by just changing out the cold plate, we can make all three of these models uh, into, uh, and produce all these three models. So we only have one common CCA assembly. And so this is this one's an example here where we have our uh, Bellman's 800 watt Vita 62.0's uh, social line supply. And with the same electronics, we can make conduction, airflow through, and airflow over uh, card card um, cards with very little reconfiguration or modification. So if you have any questions, uh, here's the some contact information, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to John Keller, who's going to moderate our Q&A. 
Okay. Well, thank you, David. Uh, we already have some questions from our online audience. And for those who would like to participate and ask their own questions, please type your question into the Ask a Question box and hit the set, Send button. Also, please take a moment to complete the feedback form that will appear on your screen at the end of the webinar. So the first question we have is, and uh, I'll just ask this question, Ken and Dave, if uh, you'd both like to respond, that's just fine. Um, uh, what environmental constraints exist with when applying V to 48.8? Ken, do you want to take that? Sure. So when you look at 48.2, that bot, that method, um, you're building a chassis around it that can operate in different environments. But 48.8 um, is dependent on air. So one of the benefits of it is, is we know that that channel is sealed between the card and the outside world, which is helpful. However, one has to realize that you have to be in an environment where you can tolerate or you have um, the air density and air available to you to actually run through the cooling channel. So when you think about that, if you get into high altitudes, like above 30,000 feet, and it might be even a little bit lower than that, if you think about density, you run into scenarios where you have to think about what's your operating environment. And I guess the point here is that 48.8, um, in a sense, may not be able to use in as many places as 48.2. So you, you, you need to be thinking about what air density that you have and that you have an available supply um, that you can use. Hey, David, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think the I think Ken uh, answered it pretty well with the environments. The analysis, going back to my slides, is all done at sea level. So as you change elevation, the performance of air cooling is obviously going to fall off because of the density of the air, um, and that might limit the environments that this uh, cooling technology could be viable in. Okay. Um, David, I think the next one probably is for you. Can you describe the application space for VITA 48.8 power supplies? Sure. So one of the main things is that if you're going to make a Vita 48.8 system, it makes sense to have all of your all of your cards be 48.8 because of the commonality in your your systems that you need to have in the chassis to accommodate even just one card. Um, and so if you're going to make a 48.8 system and you're going to have a Vita 62 power supply in it, it probably should be Vita uh, 48.8. Uh, beyond that, as you as the benefits of this, these coolant technologies are presented, you need more power because you're going to have more capability in your electronics. That's your, one of the benefits that you're getting from using these more capable coolant technologies. So you're going to need to be able to provide more power, which means that you're going to be dissipating more power in the power supply due to inefficiencies, and you're going to need that V to 48.8 in order to get to those, uh, those levels. Okay, uh, David, as kind of a follow-up, which VITA standard rack does the airflow over fit into? So the intention uh, from how we've uh, des described it is that it's kind of like a VIA 48.1 card cage that you can kind of buy off the shelf. And you can, and they also, many vendors also make adapters that provide conduction cooling rails for that. And that provides a channel for airflow to flow over the exposed 0.2 inches of fins. Uh, so it's intended to be basically be able to go into a V to 48.1 type uh, card cage. Okay. Um, can a question from the audience: Why is liquid cooling not an option here? Do do these standards we've been talking about? Have to do only with air, or is there uh, is is there applicability to uh, liquid cooling here, perhaps in combination with air? So, good question. I mean, there are, and I don't think we did, we 
we probably put a, should have added these to the list, I guess. There's other standards that are defined for liquid cooling. So that, me that, that method can be implemented. Here you've got things called quick disconnects that go into the cards and you have to have a cooling loop and then a radiator of some sort to exchange the heat. So it doesn't negate it. However, there's another level of complexity uh, with liquid cooling besides the medium and then the method that you use to transfer the medium through some kind of a plumbing system and then how you radiate and get rid of the heat um, when you're using it. So uh, maybe a topic for another day to compare and contrast liquid, but in the application space, as I mentioned, uh, I don't know how many times we've wished we had liquid <laughs> available, but in a lot of platforms, they're just not there. It's just not there. Okay. Um, how rugged is that number 440 jack screw mounting? Has it undergone vibration testing? Who'd like yeah, to take that? I think to, I'll take it. I think there was uh, some concern, so that's been beefed up, but relative to 48.8 modules passing shock and vibe i spoke to some of the industry experts about this that apply it and they have taken various systems both ground and platforms aloft through uh shock and vibration with 48.8 modules so uh, we can not not addressing every case but we can take away from that is that um the the primes are out there um, looking at that and have employed it and used it in places where there's uh, rigorous shock and vibration requirements. And I'll also just refresh my comment that Vita 48.8 was actually revised very recently in order to take lessons learned and uh, provide them to the community so that uh, that is less of a concern going forward uh, and uh, the standards out there so you can uh, review that. Okay, I have a, a question here uh, from, uh, I think it's addressed to both of you, and it's a question from our friends at Boeing. What are your thoughts on Vita 48.8 passing vibration testing? James, you Andy, want to take? start? Yeah, so I think that it's pretty similar to the last question um, we asked, and I think, the, as, as uh, Ken stated, He's talked to people who have said, stated that they've qualified systems that utilize this cooling technology for uh, for ruggedized environments, uh, and that Vita 48.8 was specifically revised in order to uh, introduce lessons learned in order to provide a higher level of confidence in the technology from a perspective of uh, its ruggedization level. Yeah, and the, and the okay. card d does the into its um, its slot as you as you take it into the slot with the angles, so you're forming sort of a, a compression against the gasket, which helps helps retain it. Um, so if you look at it in context of 48.8, you don't have this uh, you know, robust wedge lock uh, forming the bond between the conduction cooled card guide, it would be more like if you thought of um, an air cooled card going in and mating with VPX connectors and then um, its face plate being hooked up to the front panel. In this case, I think it's better than that because you've got this wedge shaped card that's going into the channel. It's mating with it. You've got the other end fixed by the connectors and then you're holding it in with the, the, the jack screws that affix it into the card frame. Okay. Um, what percentage of cuts off the shelf modules does Elma provide as Vita 48.8 compliant? So we're getting to the place where uh, our partners, we mentioned a few partners, Contron and, uh, and folks that are out in the ecosystem concurrent have available 48.8 SBCs where Anyone in industry that needs that product can buy them um, uh, separately or can 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 obtain them separately. Uh, Elm is also working with a company called Interface Concepts. It's developing 
48.8 based Ethernet switches that will be available in 3U. We'll have those in two flavors. So that's bringing switch product to, to the marketplace that will be available. And I imagine some of the other switch suppliers will start following suit. So I think the ecosystem is, is fleshing itself out, which is really nice because before, even the big guys out there had to make everything or induce someone to make those products uh, for them for their needs. So it's uh, it's starting to develop to where these technologies are going to be available off the shelf. Hey, Dave, David, did you want to add? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll mention that, you know, uh, any of our cards, Bellman cards, should be able to be provided with any of the cool technologies that uh, we talked about today with the airflow through and airflow over. And we're also investigating other uh, the other cooling technologies of Vita 48.5 and dot .9. Okay. Uh, is Vita 48.8 uh, approved for rugged flight environments at high altitude? And is there an altitude or application restriction? Ken, what do you think? Yeah, I think if it's... Um not pressurized within the in the airframe, then there's going to be an altitude restriction. So um, I think the other part of that question was, for instance, could you use it in something like a rotary aircraft? And the answer for that is yes. So one has to look at what uh, what your operating environment is, and then think about the medium that you have to deal with, which is air in this case, and then where you're getting it from. So it, it, it would be restricted. Okay. David, did you have any, anything to add to that? No, I think that's a uh, pretty good answer. Okay. Um, with standard conduction cooled technology, the card's environmental specifications were pretty simple. For example, it'll operate as specified as long as the card edge is kept below 85 degrees C. How will this be specified now with 48.8? Is it now a combination of airflow rate, air temperature, and card edge temperature? Ken, have you run into that? Yeah, well, I think maybe that might be some of the criticism of 48.8. It gives you the mechanisms to be able to deal with this, but then there's no cookbook associated with it. So there's no set of tables that you drop into because the way the standards set up the, um, let's say, the implementation. So, yeah, I guess, you know, it's sort of boiled down because in the conduction scheme, you really look at the edge temperature and then how you work backwards from it to keep your card at a junction temperature that you need to be at. In this case, it's more complex because one has to look at what the air temperature is. So you have to set a max on that in your model. And then you've got to look at what mass flow you're moving across that convective surface. So there's a few parameters to keep track of. Maybe that's the <laughs> the cost of entry to gain the benefit in, in a sense. But, um, yeah, one might say there's a few more moving parts here in this application than there, there would be in, in conduction. Uh, I see it as being more uh, difficult in the context of having to collaborate with the uh, card vendors and, and balance that in the context of divide, designing a 48.2 system the person who's designing the heat exchanger and the card walls is the one that's in complete control of all those different uh, parameters, the airflow rate, their, uh, their the inlet temperature, and what they want to have each card edge be. In the context of 48.8, that's distributed amongst the different cars in the system. So each, so the system designer is going to have to collaborate with the various vendors in order to create a holistic system. I don't think it necessarily uh, means you have to do anything differently. It just means that you have to get the information from different places, which might end up now, being did, more of a logistical challenge. Yeah, sure. I Does think, that complicate um, attempts at, you know, placing uh, uh, sensors and computing subsystems 
um, for predictive maintenance, um, uh, failure prediction, things like that based on long-term trends. It sounds like it might be a little bit more complex than it would be with uh, conduction cooling. Is that the case? I don't know whether it really is. I mean, if you think about the conduction model, we if we expanded what we showed in the presentation, you'd see a chassis wrapped around that conduction card guide that's really a similar thing. It's got fins. You're drawing air down by those fins, and you're cooling a cold wall. So. Here, that's just collapsed in, and that heat exchanger becomes the heat dissipator that moves to the top of the card. So I'm not really sure it changes that that much. In one sense, okay. I think what you'll get is you're probably, you may be getting a more reliable system with AFT in that you're able to operate it, you know, at a lower temperature at the junction than in a, than in a higher temperature on the on the high end so that might help you out okay um dave did you have anything to add no i think that uh kind of echoes my point from that i made previously okay i did um, want to say that um dave's slide showed some good stuff in that the curves that bellman's gone to uh, links to produce provides information for the uh, applications engineer or the system designer where if the manufacturers of these cards start pr producing that uh, that information um, that that's helpful so it makes it maybe a little less as Dave mentioned as a less of a logistical challenge to get to the data that you need okay is Vita 48.8 compatible with XMC mezzanine cards? Ken, what do you think? Uh, let's see. I think that's true. Well, one just has to um, apply the uh, to to make the heat dissipator appropriately. I believe in one of them, check my slide with respect to the Contron offering, because I think they call that out here. Okay. I was looking real quick. Yeah, you have some right. sites on the IO intensive um, slot on the concurrent board. So that in one case, that it, it's, it's showing. Okay. All right. Um, another question. I don't have any special software products. So when I design, how do I figure out if my concept would work well? I often design thermal management systems, and you know I've been curious about this. Ken, do you have? Do you know? I think uh, if the question is. Do you need a tool to model the performance? I mean, typically this is the case either with it being, being conduction or it being um, convectively cooled. So there are a number of tools out there, but in our case, we'd use something like Flowtherm to develop the models. So, yeah, so in the typical conduction cooled, you can usually solve the thermal simulation problem using finite element analysis. But with the airflow, it usually requires a CFD analysis, which uh, typically is a more costly package, unfortunately, but that is part of the, uh, you know, the, the trade that you have to do to get this enhanced performance that's provided by it. Okay. Um, will Vita 48.8 reduce the life of the backplane connector? And to amplify, with the original VPS, VPX connectors, it was found that they weren't as durable in a high vibration environment as desired, such as the finish of the contacts would wear through too quickly. And a more rugged connector was developed to address this. Will Vita 48.8 bring back this issue and require a new, more rugged version of the VPX backplane connector? What do you think, Ken? I think that um, 
you can still use that connector. So the the question really becomes, you know, does your card offer more stress because of the way that it's mounted inside the 48.8 rack? And anecdotally, I don't really know how to comment on that. My gut feel is that you'll be able to secure it in a way that's adequate. Uh, but, you know, vibration curves are going to be different from implementation, implementation to implementation. It's something you would find when you run through the test and you make measurements of the actual thing, whether you've got any kind of resonances that are um, really severe that might contribute to that. So I don't think I can give you an off-the-cuff answer. Okay. Uh, so, Dave, do you have any thoughts? Well, uh, Vita 62 power supplies don't use the the Vita v, Vita 46 connector or the SAT series tech connector. There is a ruggedized version of the connector that's produced by TE for Vita 62, which does have a thicker gold plating on it, um, and that's what we'd recommend people use. Okay, and uh, Dave, in, in the Vita 48.8 power supply that was shown in the presentation, how heavy was that? So we we spec that power supply at 2.6 pounds max. Uh, it'll usually come in a lower than that on a uh, typical basis. Uh, you know, you're you're moving the weight from the card cage to the card itself. So you, you do it does more heavy. It's heavier than a conduction cooled power supply, which usually comes in around 1.7 pounds. That same model in conduction cooling, um, but you, but uh, you do get that half inch extra. Of basically solid aluminum. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, what are your thoughts on uh, multi-surface thermal path wedge locks or sawtooth wedge locks? Ken or Dave? I've I've seen some of those. Um, newer well let's say more unique wedge locks that provide another path and they're they're going to help you so what you can do to get that um, drop across the wedge lock down and make its uh, um, thermal resistance lower give you another contact point it's going to be a benefit okay and dave did you have any thoughts on that um from our experience the one of the reasons why Bellman does what we call secondary side wedge locks uh, is actually an option to find Vita is that the the surface opposite the wedge lock the wedge lock is pressing into the cold wall is that is where most of the thermal transfer is so we focus on trying to optimize optimize that in our designs so while you certainly will get a benefit of using uh, more I'll call it exotic wedge locks uh, we think that there's probably uh, better ways to spend your money uh, and uh, to get equal performance. It's very okay. marginal. All right. Um, would you be able to recommend a partner or source that could support us on Vita 48.8 thermal design uh, for our products? What do you think, Ken? It's a is the context is a system chassis or the context the board itself? I don't have any more than that is in the question. So I think at the chassis level, you know, Elma could be one of those uh, suppliers that could do that. On the card level, there's probably some uh, fr shops out there that support. Um, thermal analysis and things like that that one could vector to that would help at the card level. And I'm sure, you know, to be fair, there's multiple organizations out there that could uh, to help at the chassis level, but Elmo would certainly like to be one that someone would consider. Okay. Dave, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, Bellman's interest is in selling cards, uh, but there are certainly many thermal design firms out there that be, I'm sure, more than willing to help you with any heat exchanger that you want to design, whether it's Vita 48.8 or some other custom thing. So I'd okay. encourage you to search local 
uh, you know, engineering firms. All right. Um, Dave, this sounds like a good question for you, and that is when and where can a Vita 48.8 power supply be used? Sure. So I think the, the number one place is going to be in any sort of Vita 48.8 system that's using other VPX cards that use that same coolant technology. Um, beyond that, we have seen people have interest in using our this kind of coolant technology on a standalone basis. Uh, but I think the main application is going to be in systems that utilize Vita 48.8 and want a power supply that matches that coolant technology. Okay. Ken, did you have any thoughts on that? Uh, no, I think they've covered it. All right. Um, can an adequate seal be made to enable the air to be to be forced through the plug-in card cooling fins? Is that a problem? Say that again. Is an adequate fan or adequate what? Say, can an adequate seal be made oh, yeah. to okay. allow the air to be forced through the plug-in card cooling fin? I think it's uh, an air pressure question. Yeah, the, the answer is yes. Um, it's uh, you know, it's something that you uh, you develop a, a material that's used for the gasket surface, and then. Um, the tolerances can be held at the card level to be able to make that seal work. So okay. we've several people that have applied it, um, and including ourselves, but others that have applied it and have been able to master the seal. So I think it's been a, I mean, to be fair, it's been a, uh, a concern in the industry about how to go about that because there's not a recipe for the seal in the standard. Right. And, you know, Ken, this is a question that I was thinking about. You know, when you're talking about things like sealing and maintaining adequate pressure of air, it sounds like that we're starting to get into more and more similarities with uh, challenges of liquid. Um, you know, when we start talking about maintaining pressure levels and adequate seals and things like that, I mean, how do you how do you tell a customer, you know, when it's appropriate to stay with airflow through or, you know, something Vita 48.8 like, or maybe to move over to liquid? How do you help them make that make that decision and make that trade off? Well, I think the system designers at the next higher level have to look at what the cost impact is going to be and if their platform will tolerate it. So um, there becomes a set of considerations with the cooling loop versus, you know, let, that let's say if you look at it from a benign point of view, the 48.2 at the module level, um, sort of mechanical solution where there isn't a, quite as many parameters when you just focus on the card. But when you work out, you still have the same issues. You still have fan. You still have to have a fan that'll survive the environment. So you're really kind of in the same ballpark with that. Um, mm -hmm. Here, you're making a seal at, at the card to try to drive the air through. Um, realistically, uh, you know, if it leaks a little bit, you're going to lose some pressure, but you're still going to have it driving air through the card. Um, when you get then into look at that and compare and contrast it to liquid, the schemes are very different. So then you have more hardware in the, in the, in the equation and you have other considerations. So I think that becomes a, then something for the system designer at the next higher level to look at and then see if it'll even be uh, suitable for the platform. Okay. Um, what is the upper limit for power dissipation of a 3U? plug-in card. Uh, Ken, do you have some thoughts on that? So in 48.2, we've got systems designed that could be 65, maybe even higher. But again, you start getting into the need to really cool that cold plate to pull that heat off the, off the rail um, to get there. And then you have to optimize the internal design of the plug-in card 
to transfer that heat with the least losses out uh, out to the edge. So it becomes a balancing act. But in that range, let's say uh, some of the uh, industry guidance has been in the 50, 60 watt range. You can get higher, but it starts to get very costly to do it. Okay. And that's Dave, you. did you have any thoughts? Uh, no, I think the numbers that kind of line up with, with Ken, I think the highest we've really done, is, which is really pushing the limit, is about 100 watts in a, in a 3 u package trying to get that out of that, and that is pretty difficult. Okay. Well, I see that we are right up to the top of the hour. Uh, we've still got some questions, but I don't think we're going to be able to get to them today, unfortunately. So on behalf of Military and Aerospace Electronics and Endeavor Business Media, I would like to thank today's presenters, Ken Grobe, Director of Embedded Technologies at Elma Electronic in Fremont, California, and David Gash, Manager of Content Engineering at Bellman Electronics in Hophog, New York. For those whose questions we didn't get to get, have time to answer, we'll be getting back to you via email. This online presentation will be available on demand from the Military and Aerospace Electronics website at www.militaryaerospace.com. The link to the archived webinar will be sent to you via email within the next 24 hours. So thanks for coming. I'm John Keller, Chief Editor of Military and Aerospace Electronics.